I'm grateful to Connie Maxwell. I can still consider it my home. You know the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child? That couldn't be more true than here at Connie Maxwell. Being a place where kids can come and live and feel safe. Connie Maxwell has meant everything to me because I came when I was six, and I'm 86 now, and I've been to Connie Maxwell each year at one point all those years. For me, growing up at Connie Maxwell was uh, just like almost growing up in a normal home, except you just didn't have your, your real biological parents, but you had parents. I had cottage parents, which uh, were good substitutes for my, my parents. When I was here, they were mothers. They were my mother because I didn't really have a, a, a relationship with my mother that I knew of, but uh, the cottage mother took me in and and loved me just like I was her own. Here at Connie Maxwell, there's a, a different nature to the ministry where uh, you might say a lot of these, most of our children could be living in a home uh, with parents if they had a home that was healthy and stable. I came from a broken home with an alcoholic daddy and actually both of my parents were uneducated so uh, there was little hope of me ever being able to accomplish much. Of course, my father abandoned the home. Uh, I don't know when or how old I was, but we were the first that I know of family that came to County Maxwell from a broken home rather than being a, an orphan. We were originally called an orphanage because so many of the children who came here were without parents, they were deceased. But in the late 40s, we changed the name to Children's Home because uh, most of the children by that time were coming not because both parents were deceased, but because there was dysfunction in the family. This place just gives them a family uh, to be a part of. We ate our meals in the, around the table at the cottage with the brothers and sisters in the cottage. We went to public schools, just like all the other boys and girls. We had recreation, we had ball teams. When I was there in the 1940s, the teams drew us together. We were not individuals anymore, we were a part of a team. We hardly ever lost a game in football. Mr. Herod, who was our coach, he uh, said that the reason that was because we worked on the farm in the dairy and we we're all strong. We learned a lot about work ethics and, and the importance of that that carried us on. And you know, that takes you throughout life too, having good work ethics. You got to work to eat. <laughs> but we were together, we were a family. We were brothers and sisters. And uh, if one was in trouble, we'd always help them out. And uh, we would always encourage one another. All the boys over there at, uh, at at school wanted to make friends with us and they could see what we, we were uh, uh, a family and, and loved one another but really what they wanted to do was come over and swim in that swimming pool and uh, mainly to see the girls. We went to church each Sunday. Three times a week, Mon uh, Sunday uh, service in the morning, Sunday service at night, Wednesday night service. We had a lady named Jeanette Murdoch. She sat up on the podium with the pastor and she moved her head back and forth, just like that, looking all over the congregation for children that misbehaved and went to sleep. And if they did, then she would call their cottage mother the next morning. One Monday morning, cottage mother told me I had to go see Miss Jeanette Murdoch. And I didn't know what I had done because I hadn't misbehaved in, in church. And she told me, and when she looked up, said, Mr. Baltzegger, can you write a will? And I said, Mr. Murdoch, I don't know what a will is. And uh, she said, oh, it's a bicycle. She said, Dr. Jameson appointed you to be the mail boy. Dr. Jameson was one that he was always dressed up and had a a rose in his lapel. He was a, a, a quiet man. I never saw him angry at all, and 
He had three jobs at Guy Maxwell. He's not only the superintendent, he was uh, the treasurer, and he was the pastor for 47 years doing all those jobs. He was passionate about finding every way possible to bring healing to these kids, whether it was physical healing, whether it was uh, m mental, uh, social healing, whether and especially spiritual healing. But he didn't uh, ever want to think of a child as good or bad. He wanted to think of a child as how do we love this child? How do we expose them to God's love? How do we best understand what they've been through and how that impacts what they are going through, particularly in those you know, very traumatic years of, of uh, teenage life. But I remember one morning when I brought him the paper and I was looking at it then and he came out the door and said, Mr. Baltz, I, go, uh, I see you read the New York Times. And I said, no, sir, I'm just looking at the sports page. And he said, well, you want a waffle? And I said, Dr. James, I don't know what a waffle is. And uh, he said, well, come on back in, I'll show you. And boy, was it good. I thought I was in heaven. But uh, that was the kind of a man he was. And <clears throat> when he preached, he, he didn't go into any details that would be over our heads or anything. He told stories. To give you a foundation, really, that you build the rest of your life on. Uh, and they do that not with a whole lot of preaching. They also lived what they taught. That's what they do here is to love on you and always from the president down, they love on the children. And just as they gave me a, a place to live and you know, food and clothes and schooling and, and they even followed me after I got out of college and got married and Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Sam Smith visited with me in, in uh, San Antonio, Texas, the month, two months before I was discharged from service. Of course, he grew up at County Maxwell himself. He and Mr. Blackwell both, and Dick Rhodes, all three of them came County Maxwell as children, so they knew how we felt. When Dr. Sam came here as a roughly 10-year-old, he had lost both parents. He was an orphan. And when he first came, he was what we would call today traumatized. He did not want to be here. He ran away on several occasions. Uh, he ran towards Saluda, which was his home. Uh, he wanted to go back home wh where he knew. Uh, we've come to understand how important feeling safe in your geography, in your space is. He kept <laughs> being brought back and, and he realized that his mom had, it had been his mom's hope that he would come to live at Connie Maxwell. So Sam came here and Dr. Jameson recognized that Sam uh, being, you know, all of his running, all of his trauma was coming out. So he, he re recognized uh, that he was not ready to start school. Uh, he couldn't sit still. Uh, he wasn't gonna be able to uh, behave well in class. So do Dr. Jameson, uh, in the first year that Sam was here, said, we're not gonna make him go to school. Uh, he became Dr. Jameson's uh, little uh, uh, buddy, friend, uh, helper around the office, and they developed a wonderful, intimate relationship. Dr. Jameson had daughters, but no sons, and so Dr. Smith uh, came to love this place, came to feel uh, confident in this place, and uh, that led to him uh, giving his life to this place. He served 46 years, uh, 30 as, as president, and uh, uh, 16 in other capacities. Dr. Jameson was a role model for Daddy all his years at Connie Maxwell. And um, Connie Maxwell just meant a lot to Daddy. He learned the best way through Dr. Jameson of how to treat people. He always had a kind word for you. He always spent time with you. He would talk to you, ask you how things was going. He was an incredible man. But we have a legacy, a real legacy of uh, saints, not only as far as presidents are concerned, but as far as vice presidents, cottage staff. 
they have been called by God to minister, to serve in this special ministry with children and with families. They have been called by God to be agents of change. And so we know that we have the challenges to try to heal, help heal and change the way that their, their life has led them. And through those years, we have tried to be aware of what they need. History does reveal the future. Often, at 109 Jameson Street North, I sit on the back porch and see a vision of the past, which has led us here to this glorious future. It's a picture of Jameson sitting there with his colleagues, Sam Smith, John Murdoch. It's four days before he passes. And as they leave, he gives them final words. He yells out to them, boys, don't get in a rut. If our kids need something that we don't have, go learn where to find it. Now we embark upon a new future, a new dream, deeply rooted in the shadow of a long enduring history. Resting on this stage of history, we boldly envision the creation of a healing center that carries our ministry to an unprecedented level of excellence. Defining Connie Maxwell as a national leader in healing trauma and brokenness. For the dreams of children, we envision Maxwell Farms becoming a South Carolina destination that would minister to our children and families, but also create alternative revenue sources to build our budget and strengthen our capacity to help more children. This plan is more than a lifeless document, a strategic direction. This plan, this plan is a living, breathing testimony of God's faithfulness through ordinary people who responded to his extraordinary call to love, give compassion, and ultimately healing in the lives of children in Christ's 